Today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Mark, the 12th chapter. But before I start reading, just a brief uh, word about what's happened up to that point. Chapters 11 and 12 in Mark's Gospel are filled with Jesus' conflict with the temple elite, with the Pharisees and the scribes and the temple priests. In chapter 11, he even goes so far as to turn tables, and you will, many of you know the story of Jesus turning the tables in the temple. So when we get to chapter 12, the very end of chapter 12, which I will be reading from today, this conflict has really reached its climax. And in these few verses at the end of chapter 12 I'm going to be reading are really the last time Jesus speaks publicly before his passion begins. So he is in the temple. He has already entered into a variety of conflicts with the temple leadership. And now these are his final words before he enters into his passion and continues to teach only the disciples that are following him. So listen now to these last words, public words of Jesus. As Jesus taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. His name was Ed. Ed was the father, a single father of three children, he and his three children had lived in their car for a number of months. Ed was an educator in a local ISD, and so his children were the beneficiaries of free breakfast and lunch. They showered in the school gymnasium. I was never really sure about how Ed got food, though I know he did, and I'm not sure what any of them did for dinner or what they did on the weekends for food. But I knew that Ed was a good person, he was a great father, he was well educated, and he was trying to navigate this new way of being, this new way of living as a homeless person with his three children. Apparently, at some point during his divorce proceedings, there was a court error, and he had ended up having to pay his wife, his ex-wife, alimony and child support which drained his finances. Ed had been paying for a small storage unit where he and his children picked out their most precious things, the things that they wanted to keep in hope that at some point along the way they would uh, end up finding a place to live after they had navigated the court systems and figured out a way to get back into their own home. John and I were privileged to uh, assist Ed in transitional housing when he found interfaith housing in downtown Dallas. And so we began that part of our journey with Ed. We got to meet him and his children. I had already made the move from looking at people like Ed as projects, you know, people that we were called to fix and start to recognize them that they were fearfully and wonderfully made. They had inside of them, just like I had inside of me, the divine spark of grace. They had value and worth. But yet, I did not see how someone in Ed's position, 
could ever make a difference in my life or the life of my family. You see, I had prestige and power and privilege. We had not made the mistakes that Ed had made in his life. Ed had no power. Even though he was educated, he did not understand how to navigate the corrupt system that made him homeless, nor did he know how to navigate the system of transitional housing. And so not only could I not recognize his gift to us, but I couldn't even begin to acknowledge that he had any value past the fact that he was a divine child of the king. God has a lot to say about the Eds of the world. In the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible, we see God gathering this group of people together to be God's own people. And immediately, he sets before them a, a way of living and being that is different than the rest of the culture that they had come from. One of the very first things that God commands those people was that they would take care of the least of these the widows, the orphan, the immigrants that came into their communities. They were tasked with specific ways of living with those people among them and caring for them in a way that demonstrated God's love for all people. Those who were responsible for making sure that the community knew what that looked like were the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisee. They were the ones who were supposed to live an example of what it meant to follow this God that had called them into being. They were the ones who were supposed to keep the holy rhythm of life for those people so that they would abide by the things that God said were important to who they were. They were never to put a burden on the backs of the people, but instead they were to be living examples of the love of God. They were to live with integrity and shepherd the flock. But we all know that even when God creates systems, human beings have a really hard time being the people that God has called them to be even within that system. And so as power and privilege and prestige began to be part of the priests' everyday living, it became harder and harder for them to care for the least of these among them. And God saw, and so God sent the prophets. And the prophets were simply other people from the faith community who went, went in to remind those religious leaders of what their call to ministry was, what their, their call was in the life of the faith community. They were called first to take care of the people who could not take care of themselves. But the temptations around those priests were great. And after all, the priests could conclude that if you were a widow or you were an orphan or you were really sick chronically or otherwise, didn't that mean that you had a problem? Didn't that mean that you had sinned someplace along the way and these were just the natural consequences of your sin toward God? And so the priests, like most of us, look at the people that make us the most uncomfortable, the people who challenge our way of living and thinking, those people who disrupt what we believe to be good and right and true about the world, and just push them to the side. Because it's really easy to push aside the creepy stranger that ends up in our neighborhoods and in our churches. And it's really easy to blame them for their problems instead of just reaching out and offering a hand of assistance for those people. A number of weeks ago, I think at the very beginning of, of this sermon series, Don had mentioned that when we read the scripture, very often we don't really 
learn a lot about God because the more, of course, we learn about God, the more questions we have about God. But that in the stories that we read in the scripture, we learn a lot about human beings, about ourselves. And I thought about that. I do listen to your sermons when you're preaching. And, and I thought about that for quite some time, and I think that's true. If you read from Genesis to Revelation, and you start to look at all the stories that are in there, you start to catch a glimpse of, of you, of me. Those stories are our stories, and they're about us. And so we see ourselves as the faithful people. Every now and then, we are the ones who really do love God with all we have and all we are. And we really do love our neighbors in a sacrificial way, in a way that allows us to not count the cost, but just to love them. Sometimes we are the ones who are so tempted by the culture and we have the will because of God's grace to just push back and say, no, I am not going to engage in that kind of behavior or living or thinking. And then at other times, the temptations are so great. Like those priests, we stumble and fall. And sometimes we deny the very existence of God because we don't want to be ridiculed or excluded. But every now and then, every now and then, we recognize that we cannot make beauty from the ashes, that we cannot fix the mess that we have created in our own lives, and we fall to our knees, and we cry out, and we wait. We wait to hear those wonderful words, get up, your faith has made you well. Over the weeks of talking to Ed and learning about him and his children, the day came when Ed finally called us and invited us to dinner in the apartment. I was thrilled. I thought, wow, we're going to get a dinner from the person that we have helped set up in transitional housing. And so we loaded the kids in the car. They were really little then. And we loaded them up into the minivan that we had. And we headed to Dallas. We got there. Ed had prepared a meal. We had cornbread and chili that night. There were five kids in elementary school sitting at that table. So you can imagine what was going on at the dinner table in those moments that they shoved that food in their mouth and they ran outside to play on the playground. I picked up dishes, I did the dishes, and then I ran outside to make sure the kids were still on the playground. John and Ed continued to sit at the table for quite some time and visit. It was starting to get dark, and I thought, you know, we really need to go home, and so we packed the kids back in the car. We said our goodbyes and our thank yous, and we drove down Fitzhugh, getting, making our way to 75. On our way to 75, we were talking about Ed, and John had mentioned that Ed had finally gotten a, a good attorney, and they were going to work out the court issues, and, and hopefully Ed was going to receive back all of the money that he had paid out so that he and the kids could get back on their feet. They were hoping it wasn't going to be a very long process. And then I said something really flippant, because you see, I was feeling really accomplished, even though I had nothing to do really with anything that was going on in those moments. I looked at John and I said, well, at least Ed was thankful enough to make us dinner. It wasn't my best moment. And I will never forget the look on my husband's face or the tone of his voice when he said to me, Ed spent his entire week's food budget to feed us. I don't believe that Jesus was commenting on that woman's offering to teach us what it meant 
to be good stewards of our money. What I think and what I truly believe is that what Jesus was doing was pointing out the fact that she lived sacrificially for the sake of her faith and for others over and against those religious leaders who were supposed to be caring for and nurturing the flock. Now, I know that right now some of you are thinking, well, I know the stories of, in the scripture, and I know those scribes were generally bad people. They took advantage of the poor, the widow, the orphan, the, the immigrant. They didn't do any of the things that God wanted them to do. And you might even be thinking about the people in our society now who are like the scribes. Let me name some of mine. Prosperity gospel preachers. The Hollywood elite who forget that they're nothing more than court jesters. Politicians generally. But I don't think that those are the people that Jesus is really asking us to look at. I think Jesus is saying anyone in our communities, our social communities, our employment communities, our faith communities, anyone in those communities who has gained any ounce of respect, look at them. And what really disrupts my life is when I think that Jesus is actually talking to me, about me. And I really hope he's not. And somehow I think he is. This widow and all the Eds that live all around us live lives sacrificially and they never count the cost. They do what they do out of their love of God and their love for people. What would it look like for us to live that way. Jesus says to us very clearly, look at her. Really look at her. Look at her. And what will you see? My, my belief is that, and most of you know this already, the way things look on the outside are not really what they are on the inside at all. We've all had those experiences. What would it mean if we really looked at her? And we looked at her so clearly and so acutely that the disruption inside of us forced us to look inside of ourselves. What would we see there? I believe that we might find that the robes that we have been wearing every single day, the ones we don't even notice anymore because they're part of who we are, would have to start to come off. What if we ripped open those robes and what we found was the children that God had always intended for us to be? About four months after that meal that we had in the apartment with Ed and his children. Ed moved out of interfaith housing into his own apartment with his children. It was a glorious day. Ed would be my age now and his children would be grown because all our kids were the same age. I don't know whatever happened to Ed or his children but this I know. On the day that Ed moved out of that apartment, 
It was the day that I discarded the first of many robes.